Hello and welcome. In this tutorial, we are going to be looking at different ways we can get input into Touch Designer. This isn't meant to be exhaustive or to create a complete patch. It's just to show you some of the myriad ways we can bring different items into Touch Designer. So to start with, we're going to delete everything but this movie file in. So I can select any of these and just hit delete. Um, right, this is just that default patch. If it didn't open up with a default patch, that's fantastic. Okay, so the first thing I want to show you is movie file in. So movie file in, right, we've probably already covered this in another tutorial at this point, but it allows you to take images, videos, and image sequences and bring them in. Now for, um, a, this is a, a static image, and kind of the simplest way to bring an image or a video in is to select the movie file in, collect the, click on the plus button over here, and choose whatever you want. Now currently I'm in like the default um, folder for Touch Designer that has all of their different default things that you can definitely use for testing. Um, the vast majority of these things are single images. Um, you'll note there is, I believe, an MOV or a MP4 file. Here it is. There's this count MOV, right? That's a movie file. It'll play automatically. And again, we cover this in a different tutorial. Um, the other thing is an image sequence, which I don't believe... I actually have some more movies in there. Um, but I don't believe they actually have uh, an example of that in here. They just have these two potentially... Um, named photos here. And what you need to do with image sequences is oftentimes from 3D modeling applications, things like After Effects, one of the choices you can make is to export video as an image sequence. And what it does is it creates essentially a folder with an image for every single frame of your animation. And you can, they typically have numbers like the numbers on here. And you can go in and you can put those together um, and Touch Designer, you can put those together and Touch Designer can play them as a video file. Now, there's a couple tricks with that. Um, that the big one is you're going to have to go find the file. So let's say we wanted to use these. So I'm going to say black 00 whatever PNG. Now this isn't necessarily going to work because it's it may potentially cycle through all of these images. Um, so we're not actually going to do it fully, but I just want to show you the process. So you find the folder, you find the image that you want to use, the, the one of the images from the sequence you want to use, you hit open. When you do that, you're just going to get whatever that is. This looks like it's like a, a dark gray transparent thing. But then in order to get an image sequence to work, what you have to do is you have to take all, you basically want to delete the file name and just reference the folder that you're pulling these images from. So if I was to just reference the folder, you can see it's already doing exactly what I thought it would do, which is it's basically doing like a slideshow and cycling through all of these different images. And you can see the play is currently turned on and speed is set to one. Right, so that's why this is actually cycling through all of these images that are inside this folder. Now at some point it may get to the video file and it may play that fully through, or it may just play the first frame. And I'm not sure if it's, I think it's probably just going to play the first frame. But so this is how you do an image sequence, right? So if you have that as an input, that's how you can get it out. Okay, so that's how we get images in. So how do we get sound in? Okay, so another commonly used input is audio file in. So we, if we open this up and we click on chop, and we go down, you'll see there's this audio file in. Right, and so audio file in looks very similar over here. There's a speed, we can cue things, we can do all the same things we can do with the movie file, except this is playing audio. And by default, again, if we click on this plus sign, Right, there are just like a couple audio samples that we can use in here. Um, and in our case, we don't need to, um, you know, use anything else. Now, the way that we get 
this audio to play is we need an audio out. So if we type in audio and we just go down to, um, where is it? Audio device out. So if I click on this and drop this over here and then connect this in, it may be loud. And I don't know if you'll actually hear the sound through my speakers or not. Um, yeah, you probably did. I'm going to delete that so it's not there anymore. Um, right, but so that's how we can get audio in and out. Now, once you bring audio in, you can do all sorts of filters and effects on it, and there's lots of changes you can make with it. You can also use audio as um, an input stream to control other things. Um, and the same goes for any input that we have, right? If you look at this, granted, it's going very fast. If I go ahead and turn play off, oh, dang it. I wonder if there's like a pause button on here somewhere. Or maybe if I just slow the speed way down. Let's go ahead. So you can see, right, that there's two channels here. There's the right and left channel. Each one has this point that's wiggling here at the end that's making these waveforms. And that point you can map to anything, right? So if I wanted to use sound to control scale or something like that. Granted, at this rate, it would be awful, um, but I could I could do that, right? We can use this sound file in a lot of ways. We can process it, we can analyze it, we can pull out just certain frequency bands to test. So like if we say there's like a strong kick drum sound that we wanted to kind of really hone in and focus on that and have that trigger something, we can do that. We could have noise in the high end figure it, trigger it. All sorts of different things like that can happen. It's pretty awesome. So in terms of audio, there's another, there's a couple other ways we can get audio in. We're not going to worry about audio streaming in or out right now, right? But this would be something where um, you can basically, you, there's an RTSP server. We're not going to worry about that. But basically, it's a way that allows you to bring this in. Um, the other way you can bring things in is through the audio device in. Audio device in is basically a long name for your microphone. So if you watch as I talk, you'll see that that waveform is changing. And if I click, I'm gonna get some big pulses in there. And so you can, and sorry if that's really loud, I'll turn that down when I make the video. Um, but you can see that, right, this is responding to this. So again, this is another way I could actually use speech or sounds that I'm picking up with my computer microphone as a way to bring audio in or manipulate shapes and sizes and, and visible and physical visible things in my in my in my network. Um, one of the other um, options here and we talked about movie file in um, but the other another one of the options here is uh, video we go to tops and we go to video device in and if you have a webcam video device in right brings that webcam information and, and shoots it into your network, All right? So you can, um, if you have multiple webcams or multiple video devices, you can select them here. Currently, that's, I just have one. Um, sometimes when it starts, it won't be active. And so it'll be frozen, it'll be off. You need to turn that on. And occasionally um, you might need to adjust the driver that's driving it, right? For Apple, this AV foundation is, is the one you want to use. Um, if you're on Windows, this is generally the one that you want to use. Um, but there are others. Some of these are for specific devices. Blackmagic um, is a video um, equipment company and they make like a, a video card that allows you to input like HD video from different sources um, and then manipulate it. And so that's why that one's on there. Okay, so let's, so we've got some video, we've got some audio inputs. Let's look at how we can get some other more physical inputs. So if we want to say use our trackpad or a mouse and we want to know the X and Y position, which X is just means where it is horizontally on the screen and Y is where it is vertically. If we want to use that, we can just double click and we can go to chop. And if we type in MOU for mouse, right, we can, we actually can control where the mouse is <laughs> um, from touch designer as well, but we want to use the mouse to 
to control where touch designer, what's happening in touch designer. So we click mouse in and we drop this down and you'll see if I zoom in a little bit that right as I move this mouse in the Y direction, that value goes from basically more or less 0.5, a little bit less than 0.5 or, and, um, or sorry, a little more than 0.5 up, it's 0.6 to negative 0.6-ish. And if I go right and left, I get to one and negative one. And um, part of that is just the way, the, the reason this is strange is because I think it's, um, let's see here, where does it say? It says it's a normalized aspect ratio here. Um, or if I just say normalized, it, these values will be a little bit different. You can see Y is from basically close to one to close to negative one. X is close to one, close to negative one. Um, the default is this normalized aspect. Um, and absolute, I think, might actually give you the actual pixel value that you're at, right? I'm 303 from w the left side and 1052 from the bottom, right? So um, it really depends on what you wanna do. These might be more useful if you were doing something in like scaling and things like that. Um, but oftentimes the most useful is the normalized or normalized aspect, um, just so you have this value that fits between really zero and one, and you can multiply it pretty easily um, to make it you know, relevant to whatever range of values you need, you need to use. Okay, so that's how we can get input from the mouse. Pretty simple, right? Um, let's look at how we can get keyboard input. So if we double click again and we go to the green, right, and we just type in key, you'll see that there is keyboard in. If I drop a keyboard in here, you'll know um, what this does is it's basically not the entire keyboard um, right now, it's just one key. And that one key is the number one. So if I press the number one, you'll see that this pulse is on and off, right? I'm getting a one or a zero, right? It's like a switch, right? It's not giving me any values between there, it's just one and zero. If I change this key number to, well, let's just change it to C instead, lowercase c, right? Now you can see that, right, one, I'm bringing up this color menu because that's what lowercase c does as a shortcut, um, but I'm also receiving this input in my network, right? So you can see that we can um, take individual keys and we can map it to, I think, pretty much any. Um, you can note we can have modifier keys, so we could use this to create all sorts of shortcuts or other things that we can do, but it's a really easy way to do a bunch of different inputs. So I'm gonna set this to one. Um, if I put a space in there and do two, then what I want you to note is that I actually get two keys in here, right? So I can hit one or I can hit two, right? And I can get these two and I can use spaces to separate as many of these different things as I want. Um, there's also a way to do channels by key name or I can say by channel number. Um, right now, it looks like it's just key one or key two, and those are the channel numbers too, right? Nothing changing there. But what that means is basically, does this say the channel is C or V, or is it like channel one, channel two, channel three, etc. when it gets output from here? Okay, so we've got mouse, we've got keyboard, we've got microphone, we've got audio files, video files, um, webcam. There are many other input methods. Um, these are the things we're going to be focusing on in most of these, um, for most of these tutorials, because it's something that everybody has access to. Um, you can see there are things in here, if anybody's ever used a leap motion, that's like a proximity sensor, free space movement sensor, which is pretty cool. Um, although it doesn't work on a Mac, <laughs> um, unfortunately, if you have a Kinect or an Azure, um, you can see these are grayed out for me and that's because um, I can't use those. Um, and then there is, but joystick is something. If I had a joystick attached to my computer, um, you can use most of the like keys or axes that every joystick has. If it's a special one, you'd have to go search for a tutorial on like, how to get full access to all the pins and buttons and whatever um, on like a PS5 controller or whatever you may want. If you do things with MIDI, 
right? So if you have a MIDI keyboard or some other MIDI controller, MIDI is another really easy way to um, have a pretty interesting um, command of different um, inputs and outputs. And I think if I just go ahead and put do MIDI in, I can't, let's see if I can find the device. Oh, it's a device, device ID. I have no idea what device. I have one plugged in right now and I just, I haven't even tested it. I just figured I'd see if it would work and it is not working right now. Um, so I would have to go through and do a little bit of extra work in order to, um, to get this to work. But you can use MIDI as well. Let's see here. What else? Is there anything else we really need to cover in this short little tutorial about different means of input? Okay, so these are a host of possible ways that we can pretty quickly um, input data and input information and, and have a means of control or interaction with what we're going to be making. So the next tutorial is going to start from here and we're gonna start bridging these into some basic networks so we can actually make usable data out of <laughs> some of these sources with like a basic example on each one of, of how that can be used. Okay, that's the end of this tutorial.